and talk a little bit about a trend that I have been seeing over and over and over again, which is dance teachers shaming other dance teachers for not knowing enough about anatomy, for not having certificates in anatomy, for not studying anatomy. And I want to explore this today. Um, I don't have all the answers, guys, obviously. I have thoughts, I have questions, um, I have some amount of research that is not um, all encompassing by any means. And I always like to approach these questions from a place of curiosity. I try my best to come from curiosity and not for, from judgment. I am still a human being, so that creeps in <laughs> from time to time for sure. Um, but I want to address this and this, we're going to discuss anatomy today, but this can go for really anything that people within your industry are telling you that you have to have and if you don't have it, you're somehow dangerous. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about this topic of anatomy. Um, so. What I find very interesting about the anatomy topic is that, as I said, I've seen lots of dance teachers, hi everyone, I've seen lots of dance teachers not just saying like, hey guys, like I'm studying anatomy and I'm finding it really enjoyable and it's really helping me with my classes, etc. But actually shaming other dance teachers for not studying enough anatomy. Um, so I find this interesting because the shaming part for me doesn't serve anyone. Um, if you want people to be interested in something that you believe to be important and useful, I definitely always believe that the best way to do that is sharing from an encouraging place, not from a shaming place. That's my personal preference. I believe in my heart that that's also what works best. But I want to explain a little bit why this anatomy question is not as simple as so many dance teachers are making it out to be. So the first point is that not all dance classes have the same dance objectives. Okay, so not every single teacher is teaching people dance for the same purpose. They're not teaching dance in the same way. They're not teaching for the same dance outcomes. The students are there for different reasons. I mean, we have every single type of human being involved in dance in some way, okay? So rhythmic behavior, rhythmic movement, usually to some kind of music, although not always. And so to have some idea that you have to do anything in a dance class assumes that you already know the reason for the existence of that dance class, which you can't. As a dance teacher, I don't know the reason why someone else's dance class exists. I know when, why my dance class exists. I know what I'm trying to get out of my dance classes, which is obviously um, taking into consideration what my students want. And you can't always do that perfectly because your students are all different human beings and they're all gonna want something slightly different, although hopefully mainly aligned. Um, so, for anyone who is just starting out as a dance teacher or who is a dance teacher but feels like they haven't ticked all the boxes that you're supposed to now have for being a dance teacher, which let's face it, another box gets added every year, <laughs> even maybe every month, there's another box and another box and another box that you're supposed to tick to be able to be a safe dance teacher whatever that means. Again, assuming that the way to keep your students safe is always going to be exactly the same, which it's obviously not. Depends very much on the dance style, depend, depends very much on the age of your students, depends very much on the level of your students, depends again on what their outcome, what, what, why they're there. Are they there for self-expression? Are they there to gain confidence? Are they there to improve their technique? Are they there to develop musicality and artistry? Are they there for all of these? Are they there for fitness? Are they there for community? many many reasons why people dance and so <laughs> this obsession now that i've seen recently of so many dance teachers talking about anatomy 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 if you don't know anatomy you're a dangerous teacher and like everyone should have to study this etc etc um i guess let me start by just saying like if you want to study anatomy amazing 
If you want to go very deep into the technical vocabulary of anatomy and the mechanisms of anatomy, fabulous. And allow that to, um, yeah, like develop your teaching, bring that into the studio, give those gifts to your students and the people who want them and resonate with them will be there and they will be very grateful for them. But let me break down um, a concept for a moment. This concept of labeling. So as I just said, let me just reiterate for a second. If you wanna study anatomy, amazing. Do I think that it's useful in the majority of cases? I think having an understanding, a deep understanding of the human body is extremely useful. But let me explain how those things aren't necessarily the same. Having a deep understanding of the human body and how the human body moves might not be exactly the same as having a certificate in anatomy. So let me break this down for you guys for a second. Um, and if this starts to feel um, really annoying as I'm sharing this, and if, it's, if you start to feel defensive, and if you start to feel attacked, just know that this is not my intention. I'm not trying to attack anyone. What I'm trying to do here is bring more nuance. I'm trying to widen the conversation. I'm trying to broaden what the definition of a dance teacher is, because it's ridiculous to think that it's something very small and narrow, and there's only one way to teach dance. Um, so just know that everything that I'm about to share does not take away from you the way that you do things and who you are as a person. There's room for everyone, okay? So the naming of body parts in anatomy is the same as the naming of notes in music. What do I mean by that? What do I mean? naming parts of the body in anatomy is the same as naming notes in music. Well, what I mean by that is that whether someone knows that this note is a C or a G or a D or an E flat <laughs> has no bearing on whether they can sing that note or not. Okay? They don't need to know what the note is called to be able to sing the note. This is so important. And that is the same in anatomy. Someone doesn't need to know the exact name of an exact part of the body in order to be able to engage that muscle group and to move. Okay, so that doesn't mean that it's not useful to have <laughs> names of the notes in music. It doesn't mean that it's not useful to have names for the parts of the body. Of course it is. And, um, you know, for specialists, it's extremely important in order for them to communicate at a level of accuracy that goes above and beyond what normal people need and what we need day to day. Um, it's very useful to have these levels of vocabulary, okay? Because then you can have a conversation at a deep, um, I'd say a level of more accuracy, okay, more precision, if you know these types of words, for example. But the person you have this conversation with needs to have the same training as you. And don't ever think that because someone doesn't have the same training as you, it means that they don't have the same embodied understanding as you of the human body or that they don't know music as well as you just because they don't know the names of the notes and just because they don't know the exact labels of the parts of the body. This is another form of elitism. Now again, it doesn't mean that it's not useful. It can be very useful but it should never become a prerequisite for saying to someone, if you don't know, and I've, I've heard this, guys, I've heard this, if you don't know how to read music, you're not a real musician. And I just stop in those moments and I say, so people in the other parts of the world who haven't been trained in the Western music tradition, let's be very clear about this, this was something that was invented in Europe, okay, the music notation that has now spread to other parts of the world. So you're telling me that in that moment, let's say like go back how many hundreds of years, let's say go back 600 years, okay, that the only people that were musicians were the people, that very small tiny group of people who at that moment knew how to read and write music and it was a very small number and it was mainly men. Um, are we going to accept that? That those are the only people that knew anything about music and knew how to play music and knew what music was? No, like obviously not. 
And just because more people are trained now in how to read music, and I'm say, I'm speaking as someone who does know how to read music and play the cello, and I've even done compositions and things like that. You know, I did A-level music and I played the cello in my university orchestra and I've been on tour, all those things, okay? So I have been on the inside of this group. I'm not seeing this from the outside and being like, wow, why don't they let me into their elitist group? No, I have been in this elitist group and heard people saying these things, okay? So I just want to make it really clear that just because you know how to read and write music does not mean that you own music and that you get to say that other people don't know anything about music because you go to other countries, there are incredible musicians, there are beautiful compositions, pieces of music, the same as there are with dances, and these people don't know how to read and write music and that doesn't make them any less good at music. This is key. This is crucial. We must understand this. This is the elitism and the ethnocentrism, ethnocentrism being favouring of your own like ethnicity, so favouring of your own cultural um, education or your own cultural beliefs or your own cultural ways of doing things. Um, you're favouring those things over what other people do and let me just say to start off that ethnocentrism is a human characteristic, we all have it, but it's our duty also to overcome it so that we can remember that we are not superior to other people just because we know how to read and write music. Is it a tool for being able to spread um, music around? That means that if I can read and write music, I don't need to actually be with another musician to sing this phrase to me, for example, so that I can repeat it. Um, actually, I can just take the music without being in contact with any other musical person at all. I can take it and I can play it. That is an extremely useful tool for the spreading of music around, okay? Let me bring this back to anatomy for a second. Okay, so the same thing with anatomy. People know how to move their bodies with extreme precision, with extreme athleticism, in many of the countries that haven't studied anatomy, okay? They don't need to know the exact precise names of it. They don't need to know exactly how every single mechanism works in order to use it in a very practical way. And it's the same with music. Being able to read and write music does not make you a better musician than other people. It gives you a different tool, right? It gives you an extra tool, we could say, for this um, easier dispersal of music and being able to very quickly look at a piece of music and play it, okay? There's that. We could argue that that's an advantage. It doesn't make people better at actually playing music, though right? And the same thing with anatomy. Knowing what the names of the parts of your bodies are and being able to explain some of the mechanisms in language does not necessarily translate to the fact that you're better at moving your body than someone else who doesn't know the labels for this and the precise mechanisms for this. It doesn't mean that. I'm sorry for people who are going to get upset by this, but that's not, it, that's not what it means. Now, does anatomy give us um, a tool, just like write, reading and writing music does, does it give us a tool uh, to communicate with other people different things? Yes, as long as the other people also have the same level of anatomy as we do. Right? They need to know the words that I'm using in order for that to be useful for them. So my question is this, you need to know your students very well. You need to know, are the students in my class, do they have this level, okay, the same as it would be pointless to hand someone a sheet of music if they don't know how to read the music. <clears throat> Is me knowing all these complicated names in anatomy, etc., and the mechanisms of how they work, how useful is that actually to my students? Because how much of that vocabulary do they know? And the answer might be they know a lot, in which case, wonderful, take it, run with it, um, have that ease and precision of communication in your class, but don't start to think that ha having like some, you know, extreme knowledge and qualifications in anatomy when you're teaching, I was going to say children, but like even most adults, like we have a very good awareness of our anatomy in terms of like, I could call this my thigh bone, 
I don't need to know that it's called my femur. That doesn't actually have any bearing on, on the class and what I'm communicating, right? And actually, you know, nearly all adults know that it's a femur um, if they've been educated in the West. But that doesn't mean that it's better to say femur than to say thigh bone. It's actually the same, right? The message is the same, the communication is the same, their understanding of what, they, what I'm asking them to do with their body is the same. And so we don't need to get elitist about this type of language. As I said, it can be a tool. If you want that precision, great. If, your other, if the people in your class are gonna understand that precision, wonderful. But it shouldn't be a prerequisite that we're now saying to every single dance teacher, you have to have studied a lot of anatomy, otherwise you're a dangerous dance teacher. It is just ridiculous. And you go to different countries and you're gonna go around telling the people in different countries um, who are incredible dancers, incredible teachers, incredible movement facilitators, that they're all dangerous now because they haven't studied anatomy. It's ridiculous. I'm sorry, but it is. And it's elitist and it's ethnocentric. And at the same time, I'm also acknowledging that understanding anatomy can absolutely be a tool that can be very, very useful in certain uh, situations. And I'll say very specifically, I think, you know, in elite athletes and professional level dancers, etc., it can be extremely useful because there's that shared understanding of the, of the vocabulary, of the mechanisms and of all these kinds of things, which is wonderful. But I want to say something about learning in general, which is that we have learned <laughs> that learning means acquiring knowledge nearly always through language. Okay, so we have this association and perhaps as dancers we can expand this a little bit because we also understand that learning is being able to translate from one body into another body. But if we think that the only way to translate from that body into this body is just visually and through language, we've missed a lot of things there. We've missed a lot of things. Mainly we've missed proprioception, okay? So I can tell you <laughs> That there are people who could name every single part of the body, every single muscle in the body, every single this and that and whatever and the other, who still are unable to release the tension that they carry in their abdominals or in their shoulders. Knowing the names for something, knowing the mechanisms for something is not the same as being able to put those things into practice. It's not the same as having a relationship with your body. These things are a relationship with the mind. These things are a relationship with the language of the, the language that we speak, there's only one part of what the mind can know. The mind can know things in language and the mind can read labels and learn labels, but a label is never the thing itself, okay? And we can know things through the body without needing any language. Now, when does language become very useful in communication, obviously, but as I said, there are also levels to, to this language. You can use very typical words that more people understand and have the same level of communication as if you've used the more specialist vocabulary. I've already distinguished in other movements when it will be useful to have that more specific vocabulary, specialist vocabulary. Um, and so all of these things can exist, but what's really sad, again, and I keep seeing this in different types of conversations, anatomy, as I said, is just one example, is dance teachers shaming each other for not having the same knowledge as you do. Not everybody wants to study with a teacher that's going to be talking about anatomy all the time. Some people want a different type of dance class. Some people want that their teachers are much more embodied in their class. They want to absorb more of their energy. They want to absorb more of the visuals. They want uh, more touch feedback, they want more other things. And so all of a sudden to make those teachers wrong because they're not teaching in the way that you want to teach, in my opinion, is really sad. And doing dance a disservice, basically. We should be encouraging each other as dance teachers. We should absolutely be encouraging each other to continue our development as teachers. That's really important, I believe to always be deepening our knowledge, but don't think that the only way to deepen your knowledge is to get another certificate. Don't think that the only way to deepen your knowledge is to learn more vocabulary. Don't think that the only way to deepen your knowledge is to gain more understanding of mechanisms on a cognitive level. 
If you can gain more understanding of mechanisms on an embodied level by tuning into your body, by paying attention how this thing feels, how that happen, how that chain event happens when I move this thing, and if you can express that to someone else through language that you both understand that doesn't have a big certification stamp on it, what does it matter? That got communicated. That's our jobs as teachers, right? To be able to help our students to get closer to whatever their dance goals are. And as I said at the beginning, there are many different dance goals. And so, again, <laughs> I always feel like it's important to stress this because whenever I'm putting the counter argument, people come and say like, oh, so you disagree with this. I believe that if you want to study anatomy very specifically and you find it very useful, I believe that that's amazing and helpful and there are lots of students who do want that and there are lots of students who are going to love taking your classes with all of that extra knowledge that you've gained there. And I also believe that that's not the only form of knowing and that's not the only form of developing as a dance teacher. I very much believe now, having done more of them myself and before, by the way, I'm not shaming these dance teachers who shame the other dance teachers either. That's not my intention. My intention is to reach those dance teachers and to say, hey guys, like you can do all those things, but just stop shaming other people um, because it's not helping us in the dance world to spread <laughs> the message that dance is for more people and that more people can enjoy dance and more people can get good at dance. If that is genuinely our goal, then we should be supporting each other and encouraging each other and not shaming each other and not making one way to teach dance and that's the only way and that's the correct way and everyone else who doesn't do it that way is wrong because it's not helpful to us as teachers, it's not helpful to our students and it's certainly not helpful to anyone who's not yet in the dance world who just sees that it's elitist and ethnocentric. That's not going to be helpful. It's not going to be helpful. <laughs> so, um, Labels give us an illusion of control over a subject. This is why it's very tempting, okay? We think that when we can label something, we can control it. So I gave the example of, you know, people who can name every single part of the body, but, well, here's another example, like, you know, people who can, who aren't dancers, but that can name every single part of the body and all the mechanisms and all this, but they can't, uh, dance and what I mean by that is they're not able to they haven't trained their body in any specific style obviously you guys know that I, I think that all human beings can dance because dance is moving your body rhythmically but you hopefully know what I mean when I say they haven't been they haven't been trained in any dance style and so there are people who are sitting in labs or sitting in university lecture halls or sitting in other places who have a very deep cognitive understanding of um, the mechanics of movement and the vocabulary of the body but who are not expert movers and so we just need to be really honest about the fact that these two things are not the same now it doesn't mean that we can't share knowledge we should share knowledge I definitely think that we should share knowledge and again do I believe that all dance teachers should be deepening their understanding of the human body yes <laughs> yes 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 is learning anatomy the only way to do that? Absolutely not. There are many, many ways to do that. And so this is what I want to celebrate. I want to celebrate the ways that you are drawn to learning and deepening your practice, both as a dancer and a dance teacher, whatever way makes most sense for you to understand better the human body, how the human body moves, how the human body works, how the human body feels, how the human body communicates with another human body. I celebrate that. Okay, I celebrate that objective, not what the journey has to look like. The journey to that can look many different ways. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm just checking if I missed anything, guys. Yes, there's one final point that I wanted to say, which is, so the message that all the important knowledge that you can learn is outside of you, okay, so that all the important knowledge that you can learn is outside of you and is only knowable by being taught through language by other people is extremely misguided. It's difficult and it's not intuitive because a lot of our education at school 
was that we don't have ways of knowing unless someone else has told us and someone else tells us through language, through whatever our school language was. Okay, in my case it was English. Um, we think that because that's the way that we've mainly been taught, that that's the most important way of learning. And so for some people they think that's the only way of learning, is to learn things through sound waves moving, which become language, which I then get the sound waves <laughs> vibrating my eardrum, and then I create that into, again, language in my own head, and then I kind of press save on that in my head. If we think that's the only way of knowing and learning, especially as dance teachers, we're in trouble <laughs> because there is so, we're missing, we're gonna miss so much if we believe that's the case. I laugh when I said we're in trouble because we're not in trouble. Like we can teach dance that way, we can learn dance that way. A lot of dance has been taught and learned that way. Um, but at the same time, like it's so limited. That's so limited. There are so many other ways of learning, as I said, we can learn through the body, we can learn through experience, and we can learn through proprioception, which is have paying attention to our own internal experience of the world, which is something that we're not taught to do. We're not taught to tune in, and even dancers are not taught to tune in. Dancers are taught also to, to concentrate on the external, to concentrate on what the movement looks like, not on what the movement feels like. And again, what the movement feels like can be described in many different ways. It doesn't have to be in this um, specialist language of anatomy, although it absolutely can be, of course, as well. Those two things can be combined. Okay, but just remembering that the only things worth knowing are not things that other people, only things that other people can tell us through language. There are many things to learn that way, but there are also many things to learn in different ways. Okay. Sorry guys, again, I just want to check that I haven't missed anything. So I'm all for learning, guys. Like I'm actually pretty obsessed with learning, <laughs> as anyone who knows me will know. Um, but don't let other people tell you the things that you have to learn. If you, especially if you're already teaching dance, and especially if you already see what's working for your students, other people are trying to control the outcomes and they don't get to, they don't get to control the outcomes for your students in your classes. You get to control that. I mean, your students get to control that and you get to guide them through that process. Um, so basically, my takeaway message from this video is to trust your own way of going deeper into understanding the human body and how the human body moves and how you can communicate that to your students. And that absolutely can look like learning anatomy and going deep there. It could also look like learning embodiment practices. It could also look many other ways. It could look like exploring music more. It could look like um, deepening your knowledge of the mind-body connection. It... <laughs> Sorry, my uh, iPad is dying. It could look like deepening your your knowledge of the mind-body connection in an embodied way, okay? But you don't have to listen to all the people that are screaming and shouting about whenever someone is saying, okay, that if you're not doing this, 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 this on the huge long checklist of what you need to be a dance teacher, and they're saying that is dangerous, for me that's always a red flag that something else is going on there. Some, there's some other mechanism at play there. There's some type of top-down control that they're trying to exert over dance outcomes that you don't need to listen to. Now, you can read the checklist and be like, I wonder what of this is going to be useful for me and my students, but you don't have to take that as the gospel because it's not. These are not the dance gods who are saying this. These are very specific uh, dance institutions and dance teachers who are trained in a very specific way to get very specific dance outcomes for their students, which are likely not the same dance outcomes as you are trying to get for your students.
that's basically where we need to put the question is like, what am I actually trying to do here? Because if what you're doing is just like, oh, I'm just teaching dance classes in the way that I've always been taught dance classes. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. We can just continue the cycle that way. But I would suggest that as dance teachers, we also get to ask the question, what am I trying to achieve here with my dance students? What are we trying to do? What do people want from out of this hour or this hour and a half or two hours or however long your class is? Hi. <laughs> Guys, I'm literally just wrapping up. But this is what I wanted to leave you with. I wanted to empower anyone that's a dance teacher to question the people that are shouting at them that they don't have enough knowledge, that they don't have enough experience just because they don't understand that knowledge and experience. And again, I want to bring us back into the wider context of humanity, into the wider context of dance and remind you all that there are people right now in other countries dancing beautifully, teaching dance in an incredibly empowered way, in an incredibly potent way, in a technical way also, in all of these different ways that don't use the language of anatomy that we do and that don't use the types of dance structured classes that we do and that don't have the types of dance outcomes that we do and that all of those are valid and that we in the West, just because we shout the loudest, just because we have the biggest presence on social media, just because we have the most access to certificates and all of these kinds of things, need to calm down and remember that we don't know what everyone else should be doing. You might know what you think you should be doing and that's great. You go and follow that. But don't ever make the mistake of thinking that you've got a perfect recipe for a dance teacher and that you have to force that recipe on all the rest of the world. And when you hear someone trying to do that to you, you say, thanks for the recipe. That one's not for me. I'm not making that today. That I don't want to eat that and my students don't want to eat that. I'm making this thing instead. And that's it. <laughs> I want to empower you guys. <laughs> this is so true. Thank you. Thank you guys for joining me live. If you've been here, if you're watching on the replay, let me know what you think. Were there moments when you were defensive? Were there moments when you were angry? As I said, I embrace all of these feelings. I've certainly had them listening to people saying what I'm saying to you now a few years ago when I wasn't in the place that I am now. So just know all of that is normal and we're just trying to protect ourselves. I guess the final piece that I'll say on this is that as dance teachers, if we could just learn that it's safe that people do dance in different ways, if we could just learn that it's safe that there are more dance teachers in the world, that that's not a threat to us, that that's actually something to be celebrated, that would be wonderful for us <laughs> and it would be wonderful for dance and it would be wonderful for our students and if we could stop competing with each other and we could just cheer each other on um, and I know that sounds a bit like cheesy and I know that it's not always 100% realistic and that's fine but I believe that's the general direction that we could probably head and it would probably be better for all of us um, then yeah but I just acknowledge that that's not the way lots of us have been trained and we do feel threatened when we see dance teachers doing things differently and we do like to feel superior by being like well I've got this and this and this and this and therefore my classes must be better than her classes listen guys I get that I've been there too but it's not the way that I want to live it's not the way that I live now it's not the way that I serve my dance students best it's not the way that I serve other dance teachers best it's not the way that I make the most friends it's not the way that I feel the happiest and so I've just decided that's not for me anymore <laughs> Um, anyway, I speak more about all of these topics in the Align Dance Teacher Academy. There's two spots opening in August to join me for the six month coaching program for dance teachers who are starting to think about leaning really into their dance teaching to doing things that really align with them and not necessarily how they've been told by other people. This is how you have to do everything. Um, so if you're one of those people and you really believe in serving your students deeply as human beings, not only as like molding them into little dance robots, I'm not so much interested in that, doesn't mean that you can't provide them with incredible technique and tuition, you can, um, but that you really care about them as people and that you also see this space to do dance in different ways, okay, and you want to lean into your way of doing things. Um, I'm going to leave the link, there's another video as well, there's lots of information out there, I'm going to link all of this because this video is long enough as it is. Um, thank you guys, I hope you're all doing well. I'm here melting in Madrid. Um, it's a hot one, I know it is in the UK as well at the moment. Anyway, grateful for the sun, grateful for my plants growing <laughs> and um, I will see you guys 
in my next video, which I don't know when it will be because the podcast clips have finished now. If you didn't see season uh, three, all ten episodes are on my other channel now. Lots of you have been enjoying the final episode with Julie. Thank you so much, guys, for watching. Thank you for watching this. Sending you all lots of love. Speak soon, guys. Have the best day, too. Bye!